Uh, our next speaker is uh, Sriram Natarajan, who is an associate professor and the director of our Center for Machine Learning at the Department of Computer Science at University uh, of Texas, Dallas. So he was previously an associate professor and earlier um, at Indiana University, uh, Wake Forest School of Medicine, a postdoctoral research associate at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and uh, graduated uh, with his PhD from Oregon State University. Uh, his research interests uh, is in the field of AI with emphasis on uh, emphasis on machine learning, statistical relational learning, uh, reinforcement learning, graphical models, and biomedical applications. Um, so he has uh, received the Eng Investigator Award from U.S. Army Research Office, Amazon Faculty Research Award, and a bunch of other awards. Um, so uh, we are very happy to have Sriram here. And uh, Sriram, if you can uh, take over. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, can you hear me? All right. So uh, I'm Sridham um, and uh, uh, from UT Dallas. I'm here to talk about uh, human allied artificial intelligence. Um, the lab that we run at uh, UT Dallas is uh, the Starling Lab, uh, short form for statistical relational learning and inference uh, lab. So uh, we. Uh, this is an acknowledgement slide to all my uh, students. I've only listed my PhD students. We have about a dozen PhD students right now in the lab and uh, uh, five of them have graduated already. Uh, five of the uh, others have graduated and we have about 20 uh, master's students. Uh, thanks to all the key collaborators from across the world, Kirsten, um, uh, Jude and uh, Gautam have done most of the work uh, that I'm going to talk about here with me. And of course, thanks to all the funding agencies that have keep, uh, kept our research going. So uh, as I said, uh, the, the goal of, of this talk is human allied AI or human allied artificial intelligence. So the key question uh, that we ask in our research is can we build systems that can seamlessly interact with, learn from, collaborate and potentially teach the human expert. So we want to really deploy AI systems in the world where they are interacting with the human. So um, they cannot be black box solvers. Uh, in the sense that you know, you just uh, give some data and you get an output, and we don't understand why it's happening uh, the way it's happening. The goal for us is to build these systems that can be a interpretable, explainable, and uh, more importantly, interactable um, by the humans. Okay, and uh, the long-term vision for us is that maybe the systems will learn new things that it can teach back to the human expert. So maybe there is some form of a co-learning that can happen between the human and and the machine. Okay, so that's that's our key goal, and and that is what uh, we are going after. Um, so, but when you think of human allied AI, there is a lot of uh, 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 intricate. Uh, 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 parts uh, to it, right? First is that um, as a classic example, let's look at uh, this this uh, medical interaction with a human agent. So the first uh, part is that we uh, are, are observing what the human is doing. So the human is taking some actions and then we can ask questions like, so why did you do treatment A versus treatment B? Okay, so this is actually part of the uh, study that has been recently funded where we are looking at uh, a cohort of pregnant women and trying to figure out if we can learn um, these condi the, the conditions of uh, these uh, uh, pregnant women, right? So for one, uh, A is gestational diabetes, right? So even if you take the gestational diabetes question, um, not all of the uh, uh, women who have gestational diabetes will have, uh, say, type 2 diabetes later, but some of them do develop. Can we, can we understand and qualify which of these women uh, uh, would develop and what kind of actions would mitigate uh, that development, right? So there is, there is a lot of uh, questions that one could add. Uh, in, inside a small co uh, cohort. But in this sm smaller problem, we can have very rich interactions, right? So the, uh, the doctors, <coughs> OBGYNs are taking some actions. We can ask them, why did you do A versus B? Okay, once you get an explanation, then we can actually figure out why, uh, if A was better or B was better by looking at potential literature. And then we can also help the uh, medical expert in acquiring more data, right? So we need to get more and more data to understand uh, the, um, the impact of treatments on women better. So there are actions by the expert, there are uh, suggestions um, by the agent. And then of course, the agent can also give some partial plans, things like, you know what, this person already has condition A. If you give the steroid, the blood sugar level will go up. So we may have to have work on something else. And so questions like these uh, can, be, uh, can be incorporated in our system kind of seamlessly. That's the goal of our, our uh, current framework. And, and to do that, there, there's a lot of challenges, okay? First, from the, 
from the perspective of the world and the agent uh, itself, there's a lot of challenges. So um, the, the data appears in um, basically multimodal, right? So you have you have on one side genomic data, one side lab tests, one side textual data, and, and the data appears in multiple forms. And they are in different scales, right? So for some of these uh, accelerometers and, and uh, uh, and, and, and let's say the smartwatches, we get data on, on, on basically every second. Every second of we get, we get these data. Um, blood sugar levels and other stuff we get only every six months or every three months. Okay, and there are some other uh, physical measurements that are made uh, annually. Some other measurements that are not even obtained for like five to ten years. So the point is that even <clears throat> even in a clinical setting, the data can be at different scale. But then if you talk of learning holistically, then the data can go anywhere from uh, seconds um, to millennia, right? And so you have this this uh, scale, and of course different frequencies, right? Not all of us go to the hospital at the same time. Not all of us uh, see to see the doctor at regular intervals. Some of us are sloppy about it. And so how do we get those uh, uh, data uh, normalized so that they are at, at, at a regular stream? And of course, the, the other problems are noise and measurements, changes in acquired knowledge. This is the civilization that once thought Earth was flat, right? Now we know Earth is not flat. And, and our, our knowledge about everything changes over time. So 70 years back, atom was the smallest element. Not anymore, right? So, so the point is that we, we, we our acquired knowledge of the world keeps changing. How do you incorporate that? knowledge into into a learning system right and of course uh, we don't really know the side effect of many things that we're doing including what we speak right we, we may say something we don't know the side effect it's causing over uh, uh, something else and uh, the last two are extremely hard which is partial observability and long-term effects because we, we we are only looking at some sort of a myopic view of the world and and taking these actions with respect to that myopic view we don't really know what happens when i move a uh, 70 years later right and and that could be a big effect and we don't really know that right so um there, there are bigger there there are these are some of the bigger challenges for uh, the human allied artificial intelligence but the biggest challenge of them all is for for a human allied artificial intelligence and i'm really pausing here for an uh, effect is human okay because the humans as humans we are really approximate okay we just make up stuff we don't really know anything but we make up stuff um i saw this uh, forward yesterday which talked about whatsapp university right i mean we get our knowledge from whatsapp nowadays not from experts right so we we are very we reason very approximately but we want the system to be exact okay even if the system fails by a, a small margin we want it to be exact we are unpredictable but we always want the system to be predictable we cannot explain why we are doing but to trust the system we want the system to be extremely um, uh, explainable and interactable. Otherwise, there is really no trust in this system. So the point I'm trying to make is that uh, humans kind of like we, uh, the, the so-called phrase is we wing everything, right? We don't really have a model of uh, what is right and wrong. We just uh, uh, wing everything. But we expect the system to be uh, precise on, on everything, right? So that's the, um, uh, th that's the difficulty in building uh, uh, the human allied AI system. So what we really need are AI systems that can understand humans deeply uh, and, and, and work with them, okay? So what, purposefully because of this varied audience, I've kept the talk at a fairly high level. So if you have any specific questions on the mathematical formulation or, uh, or, or anything, including experiments, feel free to contact me uh, in my email. I'll be happy to respond, okay? But I've kept it at a high, fairly high level on purpose. So given this background, we, we believe that there are three fundamental steps to human allied AI. The first step is we need really efficient, effective learners. So you really need an underlying robust learning mechanism for this to work, okay? So they have to be generalizable, they have to be explainable. And uh, at this point, we are assuming that we are not taking human knowledge. And the second step are the systems that can exploit the human knowledge, which basically says that humans are not just mere labelers, humans can give rich inputs, right? Because if you, if you deploy a system in clinic, which only uses electronic health records, then it really makes no sense. You have a physician who has 60 to 80 uh, you know, sometimes 60 years of, of uh, medical knowledge that they have worked with, right? And and why ignore that data, right? Why ignore that knowledge that they have gathered? Um, in, in some of the fields like physics, you have knowledge for about, you know, a millennia. Why are we ignoring that when we are uh, writing our models? We should not. So that that is the second step where um, we are using, allowing the humans to give us richer uh, inputs. And, and the human is treated more than a mere labor, okay? So this is the second step. The third step is where Instead of the human giving all the advice up front, the system should close the loop in the sense that it should know what it knows and ask a question 
about what it does not know. So in some sense, the, the training of the system should uh, emulate a teacher-student uh, uh, interaction. So a human is the teacher, um, the AI system is the student, and, and the teacher should explain things, and the student should be able to put up the hand and say, look, I, I understand this, but I have, a, I have a small problem here. Can you help me? Or why did you say what you just said? And what happens there is, there we are really making the system truly intelligent, right? Uh, and because the system can know what it knows, uh, explicitly compute its uncertainty about what it does not know and solicit that information uh, from the human. So uh, these are the three steps. So what I'm going to do in the next uh, 15 minutes is uh, try and spend five minutes on each of these uh, uh, systems and then, um, and then go from there. So first uh, step is effectively uh, learning, effective learning. And to do this, our backbone really is uh, the idea of functional gradient boosting. There, um, I, 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 I tend to think of this as uh, 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 um, letting a thousand flowers bloom. So where we are basically learning multiple weak models rather than a single uh, monolithic complex model. Okay, So the idea is very simple. You take the current model, you compute the uh, um, predictions based on the current model, compute the difference between the data and the predictions. That becomes gradient. OK, so let's say uh, we are interested in in uh, uh, in predicting, you know, uh, who who uh, will uh, develop diabetes, for instance, um, let's say that I'm, I have diabetes. So then um, the data uh, says that Sri Ram has diabetes and the prediction says that, uh, uh, let's say, Sri Ram has a diabetes with 0.6 probability, then the difference 1 minus 0 0.6, 0 0.4 becomes my gradient. OK, um, Arun, for instance, uh, uh, seems quite fit. So let's say that he doesn't have diabetes. And so uh, we are inter and, and the, according to the data, Arun does not have diabetes. Um, uh, so his probability is going to be zero. But let's say my model predicts that he has a diabetes with 0.17 probability. Zero minus 0.17, negative 0.17 becomes his gradient, okay? So minus plus 0.4, this is negative 0.17. What do we do? We fit a small model to this data, okay? This small model is going to just look at 0.4 and minus 0.17. Now, let's say mine has moved up to 0.83, okay? So my, my new gradient would be plus 0.17. For him, let's say it reduced to 0.08. So his negative uh, gradient is going to be negative 0.08. So in the next step, what we have done is we have taken a small step towards going making mine one and his zero. And we keep doing until convergence, okay, until all the data points are converged or some predefined set of uh, criteria are met. Okay, again, I have purposefully uh, brushed the math under the rug. So uh, please uh, uh, feel free to email me if you have specific questions. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, share the papers also with you um, on, on this topic. So, so this is the idea. And, and the, most of the times our multiple weak models are simple trees because A, they are easy to understand. And then you understand how these uh, uh, gradients are coming up. And B, more importantly, if I have a bunch of trees there is a way uh, that i can actually mathematically add them to uh, create a larger tree which is a little bit more explainable than than any other black box model okay so what we have done has taken this and we have applied this to a variety of problems we have done this in probabilistic graphical models where we can learn bidirected models undirected models sometimes directed models um, we've used this on temporal data instead of predicting um, if an event will happen, instead of predicting if somebody is going to uh, let's say have a heart attack we can predict when somebody will have a heart attack Right? So it's not just the question of if, but when. And, and looking at time as a continuum rather than at strict uh, frequencies and um, at uh, strict uh, discretization of the time. Uh, we looked at uh, time as a continuum and, and build these continuous time models. We can learn with hidden data, uh, latent variable models. Uh, uh, we have been working on learning from demonstrations. Uh, very recently, we have extended this to actually even doing neural models and learning um, uh, different uh, neural models uh, on top of this. Um, and of course, uh, one of the most important aspect of the way we use this is that we can allow for generalization and transfer which means you can learn on one problem and then use and uh, uh, deploy it on a slightly different problem so we can learn about let's say cardiovascular events and then use that and deploy it on predicting diabetes and so uh, so those are the different types of um, uh, uh, models that we have done uh, with gradient boosting and of course, the, the more, uh, uh, I guess, I'm really proud about the fact that we have deployed it on several real applications. So uh, predicting cardiovascular risks from electronic health record uh, data, uh, predicting cardiovascular risks from uh, a clinical study data, um, predicting three-way classification of Alzheimer's, uh, real-time strategy games, uh, working with uh, IBM on uh, handwriting recognition. We have worked on um, uh, image uh, segmentation of microscopic images. Actually, a very tough problem um, using using this uh, type of work. And uh, one of the recommendation systems that I cannot name is actually running our, our code. 
uh, for recommendation. So it's 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 been broadly applicable, and we've uh, done on several of these problems. But I do want to highlight one particular problem that we have recently published, which is on even doing causal models. Right, Ca learning causal models from data is extremely hard, but using our, our trick, you can learn and and uh, and uh, uh, scale it up a little bit. So, for instance, we are looking at postpartum depression in women and trying to understand why postpartum depression. And, and some of these causal models look so beautiful. So, for instance, the things like prenatal anxiety prenatal depression and marital satisfaction um, are, are key factors in, in, uh, in postpartum depression. But there is one more, right? The citizenship is important uh, in, in figuring out if somebody has postpartum depression. Turns out that some cultures are, are much more socially uh, uh, supportive than the others. So uh, th this data was obtained in Bloomington, Indiana, when I was a faculty there. Um, and in Bloomington, Indiana, the international students typically, typically had their parents come for social support. So the parents are there for six to three to six months, okay? And that does definitely reduce um, the postpartum depression in women. So the point I'm trying to make is that with, with, with such learning models, we are even able to learn some complex uh, causal models. Um, look at uh, marital satisfaction here. That's another uh, classic example. Childcare stress, right? I'm a father of four year old, I can tell you. Childcare stress is extremely important in, in uh, uh, predicting if uh, the marital uh, satisfaction is okay or not. First time mom, right? An unplanned pregnancy, uh, education level. So the point I'm trying to make is that if you, given a bunch of um, uh, random variables uh, or features in the classic machine learning setting, we can start learning and understanding even if there is any uh, causal interaction between these features and these random variables. Again, this is purely learning from data. We have not yet brought the expert in it, which is what we're going to do next, right? So before that, I want to also uh, point out to the uh, to the um, uh, the fact that we have all our software, every uh, paper that I've talked to here, every idea that are, uh, I have talked here is freely available and they are uh, available in our uh, web page, you can download the software. Uh, we provide constant support. Um, and uh, there's also a nice uh, documentation of, of these uh, 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 algorithms that one can download and play with. Okay, so feel free to reach out. And if you if you raise an issue or anything in the wiki um, and uh, in the Git, uh, one of my students and or myself will respond immediately and, and uh, we'll try and uh, fix it for you. Okay, so uh, feel free to use the uh, software. So as I said, we have uh, mainly talked about just using the data till now. Um, I want to bring in the expert, okay? And, and the first step we're going to do is we're going to uh, uh, bring in the expert to give uh, advice before the learning, okay? So the advice is given a priori to learning. This is not a new idea, right? So Marvin Minsky uh, in, in his 60s uh, seminal paper uh, when, he, uh, when he viewed uh, AI talked about advice taking systems, right? So from then on till now, there's a lot of work uh, in advice uh, uh, taking, right? Um, and Tom Michel has a beautiful chapter in, in his uh, book where he says, the Futility of uh, bias-free learning, and uh, bias-free means inductive bias, which is provided for learning, right? So, in before you're learning, before you're learning, given a small data set uh, in in an infinitely uh, possible hypothesis space, you could you could have multiple competing hypotheses, right? And so, you need some sort of an inductive bias, which tells you what is the right hypothesis. In my view, the best uh, inductive bias that you can get is from a domain expert. Okay, so for instance, a domain expert can give you different types of advice. The first advice could be what we call as qualitative constraints, monotonicity, synergy constraints. So for instance, things like higher uh, higher uh, body mass index can uh, uh, result in higher chances of diabetes, okay, simple. Or things like higher body mass index with a uh, high blood sugar level um, can increase uh, uh, the chances of a heart attack, okay. Now you are now talking about two features interacting uh, in, in, a, in a certain way uh, to, to influence a third feature. This is called as a synergy. You can also give anti-synergy. So for instance, uh, uh, higher, uh, uh, high blood sugar level, but with lower uh, uh, HDL can increase in, in higher heart attack, okay? So again, you are not talking about anti-synergy, two things uh, having opposite uh, uh, values, uh, but contributing towards a third one. Okay, now, of course, uh, the previous talk also um, uh, talked about precision versus recall. It's extremely important to understand this trade-off, right? So for instance, 
if you are predicting, let's say, who has corona, it is important that it's, it's okay if you quarantine a few people uh, who are false positives in the sense that um, if they have corona, if they don't have corona, but your model predicts that they are uh, having corona, it's okay because you're just going to quarantine them. It's going to cause a little bit of annoyance for them, but at least you're keeping the rest of the population safe. On the other hand, false negatives where somebody has corona, but you let them out. And of course, they don't know, right? They are not doing this on purpose. They have corona and you let them out. Then that could actually create a smaller epidemic right you can small, uh, cause a small cluster so the point is that you have to understand when one thing is important the exact opposite is linkedin right in linkedin for instance even two days back i got this uh, message saying there is a postdoc position open at indiana university on a precision health initiative i'm one of the pis in that grant okay so th the problem there is they are trying to maximize uh, recall in the sense that they are trying to maximize everything that is relevant to me present present in that way that is not quite right yeah uh, what they should be maximizing is the even if they present uh, four or five things that are uh, extremely relevant to me, then I'm going to look at that email, right? So that is maximizing precision. So understanding when precision is important. In clinical uh, problems, typically recall is important. In, in other problems like recommendation, typically precision is important. And you, you can, uh, our algorithms treat them as a norm. And you can actually choose one of these values and then uh, uh, work uh, with that. Okay, so that is extremely important. Of course, the third type of uh, knowledge is preference knowledge where you can say, I prefer A to B, right? The best example I always have is my student Philip's example. He says that sometimes when his dad runs um, uh, stop signs he or, or red light, he will immediately turn and say, you should not do that, okay? What I did was a mistake, you should not do that. And that is an extremely important advice because the demonstration is, is noisy. Demonstration is incorrect, but the advice is correct, right? So some data could be incorrect, but the advice that you give is correct and you want to be able to use it, right? So again, I'm sweeping the details under the rug. Recently, what we have done is we have taken that type of advice and, and put it in, in boosting, right? So for instance, uh, I, you can see here, um, as A increases, this is a simple uh, model where as A increases, these uh, uh, values should also uh, increase. And so uh, you can see that the region R2 has a slightly different uh, result. I mean, all the yellow should be on one side and all the green should be on the other side. They are exactly the opposite. Same thing here in the bottom. Um, uh, the purple should be on one corner and the green should be on the other corner and they are flipped. So there, there are some errors in the data. It's noisy, but the advice is very good. And what we have done is we have basically developed a unified framework, which explicitly trade-offs between what you have said in the data and what you have said in, as advice. So the standard question that everyone asks me is, what if advice is incorrect? Well, because we are trading off between data and advice, um, if the data is incorrect, advice will compensate. If advice is incorrect, data will compensate. If both are incorrect, nobody can do anything, right? <laughs> garbage in, garbage out. So uh, you 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 gotta hope that one of them is correct. And so, uh, but bottom line is we are able to learn a much powerful uh, and uh, much more effective models um, using using such constraints. So, for instance, um, in the HELOC data set, the famous uh, housing data set, uh, we have very nice uh, uh, performance. That's our blue curve, uh, and you can see the orange and uh, uh, green curve are the uh, baselines that we have used um, using the standard gradient boosting and already existing gradient boost that can take this advice but not in a robust manner okay so and uh, and and we've done this in other uh, uh, formalisms as well probabilistic graphical models relational models reinforcement learning inverse reinforcement learning planning and neural models so we've, we have extended this idea of taking human input rich human inputs in in uh, many different uh, learning models uh, again feel free to reach out to me if you have questions so i want to come to the uh, last part um, and before that, I, I want to mention that, you know, we are doing these in the context of real clinical applications, many of which I talked about um, already, so I don't want to go too much into this. We've been doing this in the context of uh, clinical applications. Uh, remember, the last part that I want to finish is closing the loop, where uh, we want the system to figure out uh, to uh, provide advice. So really what happens is when I give you an advice, they, they become a polygon in the, in the feature space. Okay, and the polygon uh, constraints are what you're using for learning. So for instance, here, the advice translates to everything inside the black triangle should be, should be black, everything inside the blue rectangle should be blue, okay? Now, the point is that as a human, turns out that we tell uh, the most obvious things, okay? So we could give any advice. So the black on the top uh, left corner here is absolutely useless because you could have inferred this from the data. Okay. On the other hand, the blue on the bottom right corner or the blue on the top right corner are extremely important, right? Because they are actually on the border and they help you uh, 
classify your learning uh, algorithm better. So the question is, what is the advice that is most useful? So our hypothesis is that the advice is most useful if the learning algorithm figures out what is important rather than the uh, the human uh, directly giving it without being asked for. Okay. So what we have done is we have taken um, this no notion of active learning and we have modified it where, for instance, the system learns uh, an initial model from the training data and calculates its prediction, uses the prediction to explicitly calculate some uncertainty over um, the features over the training examples, and then selects the most uncertain questions and asks the human. So for instance, I could take two features and say, what do you think is the relationship between these two features? And you could say, it's a monotonic constraint, it's an anti-monotonic constraint, it's a synergy constraint, and so on. So what can happen is using that, you learn a better model. The other, of course, advantage, if you go back the slide is because you get constraints, um, these constraints don't just give you uh, the constraint, but gives you several thousand examples possibly for free. So your learning it turns out to be much more efficient and effective um, if you use these constraints. So uh, the hypothesis that we are uh, currently working on is if you use passive learning, let's say you need n examples, active learning, which queries for these examples requires logarithmic of n. And, we've, uh, and there's been some prior work that shows that advice-based systems that use inductive, uh, uh, advice as inductive bias also reduces the number of examples to uh, logarithmic of n. Our uh, hope is that, and, and we are working on this, is that actually when you use this active advice frequent uh, uh, way of uh, asking questions, elicitation of, of questioning on the expert, we may go for log log n, you know, which is a bigger uh, reduction, exponential reduction in terms of the number of examples learned, uh, needed to learn a robust hypothesis. So uh, I'm not going uh, into the detail, but uh, we've done some work again on planning, reinforcement learning, and uh, probabilistic models. But I'm just talking about planning here. For example, uh, we have this interface where we are building these uh, blocks and stuff and then the system can interact with the human and ask questions why do you want to build it this way should i uh, call this uh, yell shape should i put this uh, clear the stack before uh, uh, moving uh, the block here or should i uh, build the tower on this side and then come to the tower on the other side so questions on decomposition are uh, uh, posed uh, to the uh, human expert by the planning system so it turns out that again um, the, uh, if you look at the figure on the bottom right uh, here uh, the red is our system where uh, it, it uh, figures out when to ask and ask the appropriate questions. Um, the blue is where the, uh, the advice is given up front. The green is where no advice is given. And as you can see in all the domains, figuring out when to ask and asking the right questions actually uh, solves most of the problems when compared to the other two methods. And we have uh, had this over several different uh, learning methods. I mean, several different domains uh, with several different learning methods. And we have seen uh, many of uh, similar results. Okay, so uh, I really want to conclude by saying that uh, if you really want to deploy uh, uh, AI and uh, uh, in the wild, then it's much more than a single table. We have this multimodal data, um, and, and we want to be able to understand relations and sequences. Um, but more importantly, we have uh, there are many cases in which human is an ally, and the AI system need to be efficiently and effectively used the human knowledge uh, and input, right? Uh, there are many different uh, steps. Deployment is one. Um, learning from multiple uh, experts is another. But the one that we really are uh, passionate about is this idea of thinking fast and slow, where let's say you have some fast effective learning at the lower level, um, kind of like using these uh, neural models and some higher level reasoning using symbolic models. So real uh, neurosymbolic uh, systems, the, the grand vision of AI uh, is, is, is definitely our, our goal. Okay, so with that, I'm done, and I'm happy to ask answer questions. Uh, thanks, uh, Sridham. So uh, I've kind of collated some questions from the Q&A. Uh, okay. Uh, so one question is, uh, how does this compare and contrast with this, uh, the classical uh, Bayesian viewpoint where uh, you also incorporate some additional knowledge into the system? Right. So the Bayesian viewpoint, it, it really depends, right? So if you have a prior, typically the additional knowledge comes in as prior, and then your data can at some point, if, if I just use them as priors, can overrule the priors. Whereas in our learning system, particularly when you're doing the active uh, way of do, doing it, the, the inductive bias doesn't go away. The, the priors are still very strong and they still uh, guide the learning algorithm. So, I mean, there, there is definitely a relation when I particularly use it upfront learning, it is kind of similar to using um, the Bayesian priors for learning, where the data ultimately overrules when I give you a large amounts of data. Whereas here, um, um, in the active learning framework, it's much more intricate in the sense that uh, the priors don't get overruled that easily. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, so one more, there is one other question. I think uh, if I interpret it right, uh, it's basically asking, so uh, how do you, in, so how can you incorporate this into systems that try to ensure fairness? Uh, is it, is it, would it make it better or would it make it worse if you have any human ally? That's an excellent question. The answer, I think, I think uh, uh, I, we are really working on uh, looking at fairness from a human perspective. Can a human uh, um, uh, provide rich advice that, that makes the system fair. For instance, you could provide advice that says, do not use um, race when, when predicting uh, credit scores. Do not use uh, uh, you know, uh, the salary when predicting, uh, uh, when predicting who should be given a credit card, right? Or do not uh, look at exper uh, the experience when, when you're uh, predicting uh, who should be given a particular credit card. So we can bring these fairness uh, uh, criteria as advice into the learning system. And, and that can be uh, done as well. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank thanks you. for the Th opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh